Hello, friends. Welcome to episode three of Ents and Sensibility, the podcast for Jane Austen lovers and nerds who love bold, witty women, awkward, handsome men, and dragons. I'm your host, Casey Meserve. Together, we'll read Austen's published works and discuss the major themes running through each of them. We'll take time to talk about Austen criticism, her earliest fans, her place as an author in the 21st century, and as much nerddom as we can get away with. Today, we'll read Chapter 3 of Sense and Sensibility. But before we get to today's reading, I want to take some time to talk about some of the societies and museums that have grown up around Austen's novels and her life. The Jane Austen Society of North America was formed in 1979 and has more than 5,000 members from more than a dozen countries. Members belong to more than 80 regional groups which have local meetings to discuss Austen novels, listen to lectures, learn about country dances, and more. They celebrate Austen's birthday each year with a tea or luncheon, and each fall, members gather for the annual general meeting, a themed meeting featuring lectures by Austen scholars and JASNA members, as well as workshops, exhibits, entertainment, a banquet, and Regency Ball. JASNA has two journals for Austin Studies, Persuasions and Persuasions Online, and JASNA News, which contains feature articles, book reviews, reports from Austin sites in England, and news about the annual general meeting in regions. It's mailed to membership three times a year, while the monthly e-bulletin, JASNA Update, provides timely news about Austin and JASNA by email. There is also an annual essay contest, scholarly programs, and tours of England for JASNA members. I have a link to JASNA in the show notes. I also want to thank listener Anne-Marie for buying me an annual membership to JASNA. I'm very grateful. Next is the Jane Austen Centre in Bath, England. It's a 270-year-old townhouse that was one of several that Jane's family rented while visiting Bath. I visited this house about 10 years ago, and I thought it was really fascinating. I visited in conjunction with the Fashion Museum in Bath, which is next to the assembly rooms that Austen's heroines would have visited, and they were a really good fit together. The best part about the Jane Austen Center, in my opinion, is the Regency Tea Room, where you can sip tea and stuff your face with tea sandwiches and biscuits. Bath itself is an amazing place, and there are a ton of things to do and see. You can walk the Royal Crescent like Catherine Morlin. You can visit the Pump Room, the Roman Baths, and so much more. Several years ago, I spent a month in England and did a lot of sightseeing while I was there. And I also made a lot of gift shop purchases. One of my favorite goodies that I brought back is an I Heart Mr. Darcy tote bag that I bought at the Jane Austen Center. I adore this bag and I still use it today. I've posted some pictures from the center on our Facebook page and on Instagram. You can share your Jane Austen trip stories and pics on our social media pages. Finally, the Jane Austen House is the house where Jane wrote and published her novels. The house is located in Chawton, Hampshire, about 60 miles or 90 kilometers south of Oxford. This was Jane's final home. It offers daily tours, and during the 2020 holiday season, the museum offered an online experience featuring narration by Emma Thompson, along with music, quotes, games, puzzles, and array of objects from the Jane Austen House collection. I've never been to the Jane Austen house, but it's definitely on the list for when I go back to England one day. I've included links to all three organizations in our show notes. Now on to today's reading. In previous episodes, we learned that Mr. Dashwood has died and left no money for his wife or daughters, but he did beg his rich son to take care of them. In Chapter 2, his son John and his wife have talked themselves out of helping the Dashwood women financially. Today, in Chapter 3, we'll see that Mrs. Dashwood has changed her mind about leaving Norland right away. Mrs. Dashwood remained at Norland several months, not from any disinclination to move when the sight of every well-known spot ceased to raise the violent emotions which it produced for a while, for when her spirits began to revive and her mind became capable of some other exertion than that of heightening of its affliction by melancholy remembrances, she was impatient to be gone and indefatigable in her inquiries for a suitable dwelling in the neighborhood of Norland, for to remove far from that beloved spot was impossible. But she could hear of no situation that at once answered her notions of comfort and ease and suited the prudence of her eldest daughter, 
whose steadier judgment rejected several houses as too large for their income, which her mother would have approved. Mrs. Dashwood had been informed by her husband of the solemn promise on the part of his son in their favor, which gave comfort to his last earthly reflections. She doubted the sincerity of this assurance no more than he had doubted it himself, and she thought of it for her daughter's sake with satisfaction, though as for herself she was persuaded that a much smaller provision than seven thousand pounds would support her in affluence. For their brother's sake, too, for the sake of his own heart, she rejoiced, and she reproached herself for being unjust to his merit before in believing him incapable of generosity. His attentive behavior to herself and his sisters convinced her that their welfare was dear to him, and for a long time she firmly relied on the liberality of his intentions. So one reason Mrs. Dashwood is staying is because she expects her stepson will provide something for her family because John acts so nicely to them. Remember that John is well respected because he, quote, conducts himself with propriety. So he's going to be polite to his stepmother and his sisters. And indeed, he is so attentive to Mrs. D that she can't help but believe he, that he means to help them financially. She's used to living on the interest of 7,000 pounds, but expects the family can survive on far less with help from John. As for her daughter-in-law, Fanny, living together has not made Mrs. D fonder of her. Quote, the contempt which she had very early in their acquaintance felt for her daughter-in-law was very much increased by the further knowledge of her character, which half a year's residence in her family afforded. So six months of living as a guest in her formal home has been brutal for Mrs. D. She loathes Fanny even more now than she did when she first met her. Quote, the two ladies may have found it impossible to have lived together so long had not a particular circumstance occurred to give still greater eligibility, according to the opinions of Mrs. Dashwood, to her daughter's continuance at Norland. So th there are a few things keeping Mrs. D at Norland. She loves the area. She wants to stay there. She, all of her fondest memories are there. But there's one other thing keeping Mrs. D at Norland. Can you guess what it is? The circumstance was a growing attachment between her eldest girl and the brother of Mrs. John Dashwood, a gentlemanlike and pleasing young man who was introduced to their acquaintance soon after his sister's establishment at Norland and who had since spent the greater part of his time there. So, of course it's a man. Now, Mrs. D isn't obsessed with marrying her daughters off like Mrs. Bennet will be, but she does put her children's interest ahead of anything else, even her own misery. Edward Ferris, the young man in question, is rich, or at least he's going to be, probably. But Mrs. D denies that she's interested in Edward's money. It is enough, said she, to say that he is unlike Fanny is enough. It implies everything amiable. I love him already. Mrs. D is like the dog in that Disney movie, Up. I don't know you, but I love you. Edward is unlike many of Austin's love interests. He's not handsome. He's very shy and quiet, and he's not interested in manly pursuits or pursuits of any kind. Edward Ferris was not recommended to their good opinion by any peculiar graces of person or address. He was not handsome, and his manners required intimacy to make them pleasing. He was too diffident to do justice to himself, but when his natural shyness was overcome, his behavior gave every indication of an open and affectionate heart. His understanding was good, and his education had given it solid improvement, but he was neither fitted by the abilities nor disposition to answer the wishes of his mother and sister, who longed to see him distinguished, as they hardly knew what. They wanted him to make a fine figure in the world in some manner or other. His mother wished to interest him in political concerns, to get him into Parliament, or to see him connected with some of the great men of the day. Mrs. John Dashwood wished it likewise, but in the meanwhile, till one of these superior blessings could be attained, it would have quieted her ambition to see him driving a barouche. But Edward had no turn for great men or barouches. All his wishes centered in domestic comfort and the quiet of private life. Fortunately, he had a younger brother who was more promising. Edward reminds me of a hobbit. He doesn't care about making a splash. He, he prefers the quiet life. He wants comfort and domesticity. He wants to stay at home in his loafers by the fire. 
Compare the previous quote to how J.R.R. Tolkien describes hobbits, in particular Bilbo Baggins. Quoting from The Hobbit, The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, and people considered them very respectable, not only because many of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking. Bilbo, of course, goes on an unexpected journey and says and does a lot of unexpected things. But hobbits in general prefer to stay at home. They like their meals often, their homes full of comfortable things, and their family and friends to be utterly predictable. That's what Edward Ferris is like. He's a homebody. He has no interest in parliament or public life. He prefers peace and quiet to the bustle of London. He's not particularly charming, but the people who know him like him or in Mrs. D's case, love him. But he's not what his mother or sister want in a son or and brother. Not that they know what they want him to do, but they want him to do something important. At the very least, he could be fashionable and dashing while driving a barouche. And a barouche is, according to Wikipedia, a large open four-wheeled carriage drawn by two horses. It was luxurious and fashionable through the 19th century. It was used for display and summer leisure driving and was designed to give a powerful impression of luxury and elegance. It provided seats for four passengers and it had a leather roof that could be raised to give backseat passengers some protection from the weather. But Edward would rather be domestic and probably have second breakfast. At least he has that younger brother who does seem to want to make a splash. Mrs. D was too busy letting her sensibilities run wild with sadness over the loss of her husband, completely understandably, before she even began noticing Eleanor's regard for Edward. She had every right to grieve and be in mourning for several more months, but the narrator really states that it's Mrs. D's sensibilities that causes her inattention to her surroundings. The narrator is kind of heartless, I think, here, at least at this point in the story. Anyways, once Mrs. D realizes that Eleanor likes him, she immediately adores him, even before she bothers to get to know him. Of course, Eleanor tries to restrain her mother's feelings, and at the same time tells the reader that she does like Edward quite a bit, but she restrains herself. Remember, she's got that sense rather than the sensibilities. I think you will like him, said Eleanor, when you know more of him. Like him, replied her mother with a smile, I can feel no sentiment of approbation inferior to love. You may esteem him. I have never yet known what it was to separate esteem and love. Mrs. Dashwood now took pains to get acquainted with him. Her manners were attaching and soon banished his reserve. She speedily comprehended all his merits. The persuasion of his regard for Eleanor perhaps assisted her penetration, but she really felt assured of his worth, and even that quietness of manner which militated against all her established ideas of what a young man's address ought to be was no longer uninteresting when she knew his heart to be warm and his temper affectionate. No sooner did she perceive any symptom of love in his behavior to Eleanor than she considered their serious attachment as certain and looked forward to their marriage as rapidly approaching. Mrs. D expects Eleanor and Edward to get married in the next few months and they'll all live happily ever after a few miles apart and they'll see each other every day. That's Mrs. D's dream, even though currently she doesn't have a home of her own anymore. Marianne is surprised when her mother tells her she expects Edward to propose within the next few months. Marianne likes him, but she finds him dull and predictable, like she probably would a hobbit. Perhaps, said Marianne, I may consider it with some surprise. Edward is very amiable, and I love him tenderly, but yet he is is not the kind of young man, and there is something wanting. His figure is not striking. It has none of that grace which I should expect in the man who could seriously attach my sister. His eyes want all that spirit, that fire, which at once announced virtue and intelligence. And besides all this, I am afraid, Mamma, he has no real taste. Music seems scarcely to attract him, and though he admires Eleanor's drawings very much, it is not the admiration of a person who can understand their worth. It is evident, in spite of his frequent attention to her while she draws, 
that in fact he knows nothing of the matter. He admires as a lover, not as a connoisseur. To satisfy me, those characters must be united. I could not be happy with a man whose taste did not in every point coincide with my own. He must enter into all my feelings. The same books, the same music must charm us both. Oh, Mama, how spiritless, how tame was Edward's manner in reading to us last night. I felt for my sister most severely, yet she bore it with so much composure she seemed scarcely to notice it. I could hardly keep my seat. To hear those beautiful lines which have frequently almost driven me wild pronounced with such impenetrable calmness and such dreadful indifference. He would certainly have done more justice to simple and elegant prose. I thought so at the time, but you would give him Cooper. Marion thinks he's dull because he's very calm and unspirited. He doesn't care for art, except for Eleanor's art. He doesn't like the same types of books as Marianne, and he reads aloud without spirit. Marianne has really specific standards for a man. He has to check all these boxes she has. He has to passionately love all the same things she does. He needs to read aloud well. He must love Cooper. And if he doesn't love Cooper, then forget it. But she does admit that she and Eleanor have different tastes and Edward fits Eleanor's taste far better. And she despairs that she'll ever meet a man that ticks all her boxes. Mama, the more I know of the world, the more I am convinced that I shall never see a man whom I can really love. I require so much. He must have all Edward's virtues, and his person and manners must ornament his goodness with every possible charm. Remember, my love, that you are not seventeen. It is yet too early in life to despair of such happiness. Why should you be less fortunate than your mother? In one circumstance only, my Marianne, may your destiny be different from hers." So for once, Mrs. D reminds Marianne of restraint, meaning, of course, that her husband died before her and left her without a home or a fortune to support her children. Part of the reason Mrs. D seems to really want Eleanor and Edward to marry is that he may act mo like more of a brother to her daughters than John does. She tells Marianne, you will gain a brother, a real affectionate brother. An affectionate brother who may help the family providing, if not money, then perhaps other options for her other daughters to find husbands and their own security, and maybe a place to live. And now we've come to the end of the chapter. Before we go, I wanted to briefly discuss who is this Cooper that Marianne keeps talking about? William Cooper was a poet and a writer of hymns and one of the most popular poets of his time. His name is spelled C-O-W-P-E-R and pronounced Cooper rather than, as I thought when I started writing this episode, Cowper. He was born in 1731 in Herefordshire and had a really interesting life. He was institutionalized for his insanity. He became a devout evangelical Christian and an abolitionist. He was good friends with John Newton, the ex-slave trader who wrote Amazing Grace. There's a really good biography of Cooper on poetryfoundation.org, and I've linked that in the show notes. Along with hymns and translating the Iliad and the Odyssey, Cooper wrote dozens of poems, such as Light Shining Out of Darkness and The Negro's Complaint, which was often quoted by Martin Luther King Jr. during the civil rights movement in the U.S. in the 1950s and 60s. Besides his evangelical and anti-slavery poetry, many of Cooper's poems were about everyday life and scenes of the English countryside. These were probably the poems that Marianne made Edward read. According to Lucy Worsley and Jane Austen at home, Jane's own books included the history of Little Goody Two-Shoes, as well as a French grammar. Probably, like Catherine Moreland, she read John Gay's fables. But alongside all this saccharine stuff aimed at kids, Jane had adult tastes. Although there were locks to the bookcase, no one seems to have stopped her from reading books for grown-ups. At a very early age, her family remembered, she was enamored of Gilpin. Her favorite moral writers were Johnson in prose and Cooper in verse. Indeed, the poet William Cooper is quoted more than any other author in her novels and letters. Jane was a big fan of Cooper. She used his poetry to describe characters such as Marianne and Fanny Price in Mansfield Park, but she also refers to his poems in her letters. 
In one letter to Cassandra, dated January 8th, 1807, she writes, Our garden is put into order by a man who bears a remarkably good character, has a very fine complexion, and asks something less than the first. The shrubs which border the gravel walk, he says, are only sweet briar and roses, and the latter of an indifferent sort. We mean to get a few of the better kind, therefore, and at my own particular desire, he procured us some syringas. I could not do without a syringa for the sake of Cooper's line. We talk also of a laburnum. The poem Jane is referring to is The Task, a lengthy poem written in six books and published in 1785. I am not going to recite the entire poem, but I'll quote the lines that Jane is referring to in her letter. Laburnum rich in streaming gold, syringa ivory pure, the scented and the scentless rose, this red and of a humble growth, the other tall, and throwing up into the darkest gloom of neighboring cypress or more sable yew, her silver globes light as the foamy surf that the wind severs from the broken wave. The lilac various in array, now white, now sanguine, and her beauteous head now set with purple spikes pyramidal, as if studious of ornament yet unresolved, which who she most approved, she chose them all. The Task is one of Cooper's most famous works. As you can hear, Cooper was known as a poet of sensibilities in many ways. So of course, Marianne would love his verses. He's a lot like Samuel Richardson, whom we discussed in episode one, but he crosses genres more. To quote Cooper's page on the Poetry Foundation website, Samuel Taylor Coleridge called him the best modern poet, and though his practice reflects in some ways a commitment to neoclassical or so-called Augustan precepts, his innovation in the treatment of nature in common life, in meditative and conversational techniques, and in the foregrounding of autobiography and confession constitute a crucial legacy to the first generation of romantics. The romantics could definitely be seen as an evolution of the poets of sensibilities, Austin's own use of space and descriptions of nature in Sense and Sensibility will show some of the influence that Cooper had on her. There are many other ways Cooper's influences appear in Jane's other novels, perhaps most importantly in Mansfield Park, but we'll get to those someday. The Cooper and Newton Museum in Buckinghamshire, England, has a really interesting paper about Cooper's influence on Jane in their online archives, and I've linked to it in the show notes. But I wanted to quote it briefly as it discusses sense and sensibility beyond Marianne's ideas of sensibility. As the novel progresses, it becomes a far more subtle reflection on different modes of sensibility. Eleanor Dashwood's dignified silence on her own sufferings show them to be just as intense as Marianne's. The popular novels in sensibility, however, place strong emphasis on the immediate nature of feelings. No sooner had the man or woman of sensibility witnessed the suffering of some unfortunate than tears would course freely down their cheeks in sympathy. Marianne Dashwood can hardly keep her seat or her temper. A whole influential branch of social and political philosophy developed from the medical understanding of the responsiveness of the body's nerves. Another thing I thought to discuss is grief and mourning in 18th century England. When we open the novel, Mrs. Dashwood is in deep mourning when her daughter-in-law moves in, and I wanted to talk about what mourning was like in England in the 1790s when the novel takes place. When we think of mourning, we often think of the Victorian ideas of mourning, black crepe and veils such as what Queen Victoria wore for the rest of her life after her husband Prince Albert died. But before the Victorian era, mourning was less stringent. The Victorians were sticklers for adherence to etiquette, but the Georgians and Regency English were less so. For example, only the very wealthy could afford a new wardrobe of black clothes, and most other people simply dyed some of their existing clothes black. Jane writes in 1808 that her mother is preparing mourning for Mrs. E.K. She has picked her old silk pelisse to pieces and means to have it dyed black for a gown. A very interesting scheme. So most people would dye a few clothes black. The poor would wear a black armband, below the elbow, or a ribbon. 
Jewelry was expected to be flat black without shine or sparkle. And the length of time for wearing black was also variable. For instance, the widow would be in black for the first six months, and then she would be in half mourning, a mixture of black and white or gray and lavender, very subtle, dull colors for the next six months. Widows or widowers were expected to be in full mourning for six months and then half mourning for the next six months. Not the two or more years expected in the 1860s and 70s. And the length of the mourning period depended on the nearness to their relations. So Eleanor, Marianne, and Margaret would have been in mourning for six months, as would John. Mrs. Dashwood would have been in mourning for a year and a day. She would have had no social engagements for the first six months, and she would slowly re-enter society in the next six, wearing those muted colors and jewelry that we talked about. Fanny should have been in mourning for six months as the daughter-in-law, but how much do you want to bet that she got out of that as quickly as possible? So with the entire Dashwood family in deep mourning for six months, how much ruder and even more impudent is it that Fanny shows up and takes control of Norland as soon as Mr. D is buried. It's really interesting that the narrative begins six months after Mr. Dashwood's death, because this is when the family is coming out of the deep mourning and into a less restrictive time where they can all start to be social again. Next episode, we'll read chapter four and finally hear from our sensible heroine, Eleanor, and discuss whether this ice queen is really the Elsa to Marianne's Anna. Mrs. Dashwood will begin to scheme and plan the rest of her life, but not without Eleanor's advice. And we'll discover that family in Georgian England can extend far beyond the people you live with. That's all for today. Thank you for listening to Ents and Sensibility. This podcast was written and produced by me, Casey Meserve. You can follow Ents and Sensibility on Facebook and on Instagram. You can also write the show at entsandsensibility at gmail.com. That's E-N-T-S and sensibility. You can also leave a review of the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. Check out our website, entsandsensibility.com for episode notes, a list of books and references mentioned on the podcast, and more. Thank you, and I hope you'll visit again soon.